Fishy, so we're gonna get started. Uh, so hello and welcome to our continuing series of birding webinars. My name is Tyler and I'll be your presenter today for Birding 201. Uh, we'll be focusing on two very cool species today. Uh, we'll be focusing on hummingbirds and swifts. Uh, we're gonna really dive into the adaptations of, of both birds and some conservation we're doing with them as well. If this is your first time attending one of our webinars, uh, we've been doing these for the past couple months. Uh, you can always catch up on the ones that we've done in the past um, and get all that information uh, on Bird Conservancy's YouTube channel. So whether you have attended all of our webinars, uh, if you're a local here at Bird Conservancy webinars, or this is your first one, uh, I hope you enjoy this topic. Uh, if you have any questions that come up during the webinar, uh, we try to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, you can enter those into the chat window, which we'll talk about that function in a little bit. Um, and we'll get to your questions either as they come up, uh, if I see them, or at least by the end. We are recording this webinar, uh, so don't worry about scrambling to take notes. Um, again, I told you there's going to be a lot of information. Um, we'll have this recorded and up on our YouTube channel later this afternoon. Uh, and I'll be sending out that link to all of our registered participants. Uh, I'm also going to send along all of the relevant resources we talk about uh, and a PDF of the slides that we are using. I wanted to teach you all about hummingbirds and swifts uh, today just because they're such fascinating and unique birds. Uh, we see hummingbirds in our backyards uh, sometimes all year long or through migration. They're kind of just they stand out to us. Um, and then swifts just remind me of being out in really wild places um, in really cool landscapes. Um, so luckily birds can be seen anywhere, uh, so I'm sure most of you attending this webinar um, have either seen hummingbirds this year in your backyard, uh, or maybe you've even seen some swifts out on adventures. So Zoom is the platform that we use for these webinars. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are probably experts on Zoom. Uh, I know we use it a lot, uh, not just for our webinars, but for attending others. Uh, but if, it, if this is your first time Zooming with us, it does take a little playing around with. Uh, I just want to point out a couple of things. Uh, down on the lower left hand corner, you can see the mute and the start video button. Uh, we want to make sure that those are both off, so they should have a red slash through them. Uh, that's going to help our technology run a lot smoother. Um, I would love to have conversations with you all verbally, um, but that's just not something uh, we can do during these webinars with the time that we're allotted. Um, and then I, I mentioned that chat feature earlier. Uh, so when I went full screen, your screen probably went full as well. Uh, what you need to do is either push escape to exit that full screen, or there's a button that says exit full screen as well. If you click on that chat icon at the bottom of your screen, that will dock your chat window uh, to the right hand side. Um, and then just lastly, make sure you're addressing it to everyone. Uh, that way we can have a conversation. And I know I know a lot, but you guys might know even more than me. Um, and I want to make sure that we all have a conversation and can learn from each other. Um, also, if you have any questions about Zoom or you're having any problems, uh, Sarah is behind the scenes. Uh, she'll help you with any of those technological questions you might have. All right, so we're going to start our program uh, the same way we always start our programs, uh, either our webinars or our in-person program. And that's by getting to know you all a little bit better. Uh, the cool thing about these webinars is we have people tuning in uh, from outside Colorado, really from, from everywhere, which is so cool to see. Uh, so in the chat window, just to make sure we all know how to use it, uh, if you can please type in where you're from, uh, so where you're Zooming from today. Uh, how many are watching this webinar with you? We want to see how many people we are reaching. And then what was the last really cool bird that you saw? So enter that into the chat window so we can see where you all are tuning in from. And I'm sure there's been some cool, cool birds seen recently. Well, brown capped rosy finch at the Rocky. Oh, I love seeing those. Those are so cool. Awesome. People outside of Colorado. So good to see. Yeah, Rufus hummingbirds. We'll be talking about those. Those are so beautiful. Awesome. Someone from California. I'm a fellow Californian as well. New Jersey, Denver. Awesome. So cool. Uh, great to see everyone tuning in just from, from Colorado, but also uh, from throughout the country, which is so cool to see. Uh, so like I said, we have a lot to cover, so you can keep filling that out. 
uh, let me know where you're zooming from, how many are watching with you in the last really cool bird you saw. Uh, and we're gonna start, start this webinar off on a good foot. Thank you. So your presenters today, my name is Tyler Cash. Uh, I'm an environmental educator with the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Uh, if you've attended our webinars before, I'm sure you've seen uh, a lot of my emails or seen these webinars in the past. Uh, and my favorite bird today and the last really cool bird that I saw uh, is the white-throated swift. Um, I love these birds. Uh, whenever I'm out rock climbing and on the side of cliffs, I get to see them buzzing by. And uh, it just reminds me of being in such amazing places on really cool uh, vacations or adventures out in the wild. And Sarah Doxson, she's another environmental educator with the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Uh, and her favorite bird today is the ruby-throated hummingbird. When I asked her uh, what her favorite bird was gonna be today, uh, she did not hesitate at all. She said it's a ruby-throated hummingbird. Uh, she didn't even have to think about it. Um, and I'm sure if anyone, any of you are joining us from the Midwest or the East Coast, uh, you probably see a lot of these ruby-throated hummingbirds um, and they're probably special to you as well. Uh, so again, if you have any questions for the chat window, that's gonna be Sarah. She's going to be helping answer questions, uh, whether it's about technology or about the really cool information uh, that I'm telling you. All right, so a little bit about the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Um, I'm sure some of you know us pretty well, but if this is your first uh, webinar with us, uh, the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, we are a nonprofit organization, and our mission is to conserve birds and their habitats. And we do, do that through an integrated approach of science, stewardship, and education. So our stewardship team, uh, they're working out uh, with private landowners and ranchers, making sure that their private lands are as bird friendly uh, and as healthy for the ecosystem as they can be, but also that the ranchers are still able to make profits. Uh, so they're working really hard with those private ranchers uh, because a lot of, a lot of the, the country is actually owned uh, with private lands and ranches. So we try to work with them. Our science team, uh, they're out there advancing knowledge. So they're working along the breeding and non-breeding range of birds. They're learning about migration. Um, they're collecting data. Uh, they're doing really cool work and groundbreaking research uh, with our science team. And then lastly, our education team, which myself and Sarah are a part of, uh, we're the ones out there teaching the, the next generation and even the, the old generation, we, we're teaching everyone um, about how we can conserve birds um, and why we think they're so cool. So we're out there sharing our passions about birds and hoping that, that you all can do something uh, to help conserve birds and, and their habitats. So in this webinar, um, we're gonna be diving really into the amazing adaptations of hummingbirds. Um, when I was researching and learning more about them, they're just so, they're so cool. Uh, so we're gonna dive into those adaptations. Uh, we're also going to learn about the behaviors of swifts uh, and some research that we are actually conducting with the Bird Conservancy with swifts as well. We're also gonna learn how to attract hummingbirds to your yard. I'm sure a lot of you attended this because you love hummingbirds and you probably have feeders out and you probably watch them a lot. Um, but I just wanna make sure we're all on the same page and that we are all trying to attract them the correct way. And then we're gonna end the webinar uh, the same way we, we usually end them is by learning a little bit more about identifying these really cool species um, and some tips and tricks that we can do as well. So I came up with this topic of teaching you all about hummingbirds and swifts. Uh, probably around a month ago. And in that month, I've been kind of traveling and taking some time off. Um, and all I can think about are hummingbirds and swifts because that's all I've been researching. Uh, and I was actually climbing a couple weeks ago out in South Dakota on these really cool rock spires. And I just vividly remember all the white-throated swifts kind of flying around uh, and being kind of in the area and high up with them. Uh, it's really special. Uh, I was also hiking this past weekend. Uh, out near Breckenridge in, in the Colorado mountains in the Rockies. Uh, and whenever I'm hiking out uh, in the summertime, I just love hearing those broad-tailed hummingbirds all around. Uh, I'm sure if you are joining us from Colorado, you know exactly the sound that I'm talking about. All right, so I just wanna talk a little bit about why birds? Uh, why is Bird Conservancy this big nonprofit organization? Uh, why are we hosting these webinars teaching you about different species? Uh, well, for one, birds are extremely inspirational. 
Uh, they've inspired us for, for ages uh, to engineer airplanes, um, or a lot of us might just be really fascinated and love their beauty and we inspires our artwork. We might do a lot of sketching with birds. Birds are also extremely accessible. And this is one of uh, my favorite reasons uh, about birds and why I love teaching about them is anybody can learn about them. Anybody can go out and see them. Uh, it doesn't matter where you live. You can live in the city or out in the mountains. Um, you can go traveling anywhere and you're going to see a bird, uh, which is why I think they're so special. They also provide us an ecosystem service uh, or many ecosystem services. They help control pests, they disperse seeds. Um, I know when I'm out camping, I love seeing swallows flying around or little fly catchers uh, because they're eating the mosquitoes that hopefully aren't eating me. Um, they are also environmental indicators. Uh, birds are one of the first groups that are affected uh, with environmental change. So we like to call that canary in a coal mine. Um, they help us understand the health of our environment. All right, so like I said, we have so much to learn today. Uh, so we're gonna dive straight into our part one. Uh, we're gonna be talking about hummingbirds. So hummingbirds, uh, they're really tiny, unmistakable birds. Um, whenever we see one flying around, most of us know that is a hummingbird. I'm not sure what the species, uh, but they're just so characteristic. Uh, you can really just, tell them from any other bird that we see. I also think of it um, as a backyard bird. Uh, I grew up in San Diego and with feeders in our backyard um, and a hummingbird was probably one of the first birds I ever identified without even knowing it. Uh, we always had hummingbirds in our backyards, which is really cool. So hummingbirds, they, along with all other birds, they belong in the class of aves. The order they belong in is actually opetiformes, um, and that's actually the same order as swifts. Uh, so that's why I combined hummingbirds and swifts because they're actually really closely related. Um, the family that hummingbirds belong to is called Trochilidae. And there's around 300 species of hummingbirds worldwide. In North America, uh, we actually only have 23 of those species. Um, and most of them are really seen uh, in kind of Southern Arizona on the border of Mexico. That's where we get a lot of uh, diversity with hummingbirds, uh, but luckily, uh, no matter where we live in North America, uh, we can definitely see a hummingbird at some point in the year. So hummingbirds, uh, they have these really, most of them have this really striking throat uh, iridescent pattern, this feather pattern on their throat, uh, which when the light catches it in a certain way, it's so beautiful. Uh, that little part, it's actually called a gorget. Uh, and a gorget is a term that actually comes from when knights would wear a metallic collar. Uh, to protect their throats when they're fighting. Uh, they call that a gorget. Uh, so we applied that to hummingbirds because it kind of looks like some shiny armor that they have on their throat feathers. Uh, so they have that really striking iridescent throat pattern. All hummingbirds are also essentially solitary. Uh, they don't really group up too often. Um, and they're also very aggressive. Uh, if you've ever seen hummingbirds at a feeder and dive bombing each other, um, they can be very aggressive towards each other. During our, uh, we were doing bird banding live webinars a couple months back with Audubon, with Denver Audubon. Uh, and there was a, a hummingbird feeder uh, kind of close to where we were staging these live webinars. Um, and me and Sarah uh, were out there a lot teaching and they would just buzz us all the time. This one male broad tail hummingbird would fly in front of our faces and dive about, about on us. Um, and that's because its feeder was so close uh, and we were kind of near his territory. So what I want you to do, uh, now is some time for some interaction, is I want you to start thinking of some characteristics that are specific to hummingbirds. So in the chat window, type what adaptations you think are specific to hummingbirds. So what characteristics you think are specific to hummingbirds? Uh, and if you're unsure what an adaptation is, uh, an adaptation is a behavioral or, char or physical characteristic uh, that helps a bird better, or an animal better survive in its environment. So I see a lot of good answers. Yeah, their long, thin beak is super characteristic. Their bill, they, they eat nectar, fast wing beats. Awesome, thank you guys so much for using this chat window. Um, I know sometimes it can be a little difficult to stay, stay up on it, but I really appreciate the interaction. Ooh, I see a good word, torpor. We'll, we'll talk about that soon. A long tongue, fly backwards. Awesome, thank you for filling that out. 
Uh, so we're going to dive a little bit more into kind of all the things that you said. Um, so hummingbirds, they have an extremely long, narrow beak. Uh, and that strong, narrow beak is a, a beautiful function or a structure that performs a function. Um, so that narrow beak allows them to reach the nectar uh, from those brightly colored tubular flowers. Hummingbirds, we might not be aware of this, but they also feed on insects. Uh, so that lower beak is actually really flexible. Um, and that actually allows them to grab insects during the, from the air during flight. Um, so not only are they grabbing that nectar, they also eat really tiny insects in, in, in air. They have a really interesting tongue. Uh, so if you attended the wood, woodpecker webinar last week, um, or you've seen that on our YouTube channel, uh, we talked a lot about the woodpecker's tongue because it's so interesting. interesting. Um, hummingbirds have a really interesting tongue as well. Uh, the tip of it, is, it's really long, and the tip is actually covered in hairs. Uh, so those hairs actually help pull nectar from those flowers. The hummingbird's brain is pretty fantastic. Um, they have an excellent memory, uh, which we're actually going to, it's so amazing that we're actually going to dive deeper into it in the next slide. Hummingbirds also have fairly large eyes uh, for their size. We can see in this picture of this hummingbird flying. Um, it's a pretty large eye for the size of that bird. Um, that helps them see really well. Um, since they're flying so fast, they need to have really, really good eyesight. Um, they can actually see all the same colors that we see. Um, and like most all birds, uh, they also see in the ultraviolet wavelengths. Birds also have a, or hummingbirds also have a, a really cool heart and lungs. Uh, so the heart rate in hummingbirds can be extremely high, uh, especially during flight. Uh, their heartbeat can reach 1,250 beats per minute. So it's 1,250 beats per minute. Uh, if our heart rate ever got that high, uh, our heart would probably explode. Um, so they have this really extreme uh, heartbeat during flight. And then when they're resting, their heart rate can drop all the way down to 250 beats per minute. So they have this wide range, um, kind of like a kid on sugar. If they had a bunch of candy, you know, they're running around, flying around like crazy. Uh, and then the next minute they're, they're, they're down on the sugar um, and they, their heartbeat starts to slow down. So this really high heartbeat, uh, this allows blood to circulate quickly. Uh, so it delivers oxygen to the muscles uh, during those rapid muscle movements in flight. The, hungs, the lungs are also extremely adapted for hummingbirds. So the lungs of a hummingbird, they serve both to deliver oxygen into the bloodstream, uh, but it also helps cool down the hummingbird. Uh, the respiration rate for these birds is approximately 250 breaths per minute. Um, so if you've ever gone hiking or you've done an extreme exercise and you're huffing and puffing, um, your breaths per minute aren't that high, <laughs> not compared to a hummingbird. Uh, so next time you can compare yourself to a hummingbird and you say, you know what, I'm doing okay. Um, so 250 breaths per minute, uh, that's around four breaths per second. Um, so you can kind of try right now, try to take four quick breaths for a second. Um, it's extremely hard to do. Uh, we as humans, we're not adapted for that. We would not be able to do that as fast as a hummingbird. A lot of you mentioned their wings, uh, that they can hover and fly forward, forwards and backwards. Uh, this is super unique to a hummingbird. Uh, so unique that we'll actually talk about it in more in depth in a, in a coming slide. And then uh, the hummingbird's body temperature. Um, hummingbirds have adapted to survive in conditions with very cold weather. Um, and actually limited food supply. They can migrate a very long distance. Um, so they're not always gonna have this beautiful spring weather with flowers everywhere. So like uh, someone mentioned in the chat window that they can actually enter a state called torpor. Torpor is uh, kind of like um, hibernation, but on a smaller scale. Uh, so typically a hummingbird's body, their temperature is around 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so a lot warmer than, than we run. Um, but during torpor, when they're just chilling out, uh, awaiting the storm, um, or just resting, their body temperature actually drops all the way as low as 70 degrees. Um, if our body temperature went down to 70 degrees, uh, you wouldn't be feeling much at all. Um, so just like their, their respiratory rate and their blood rate, uh, these animals are adapted for, for really big extremes of highs and lows and fast and slow. Um, and they'll just wait out that time in torpor until the storm passes. Uh, and then they'll get all jazzed up again, ramp up their, their body temperature and their heart rate, and go searching for more nectar. 
And also while you guys are looking at these slides, if you know, if you can identify any of these hummingbirds or any of the birds, uh, feel free to share that knowledge and type it into the chat window because we're not going to use all of these on our, our birding quiz. Um, so bird brain, not so much. Uh, humans, we like to use bird brain as kind of uh, not the best term. We like to maybe call people that aren't as intelligent or uh, maybe are a little clumsy that, you know, you have a bird brain. Uh, but if you've attended some of our past webinars, uh, this isn't true. Birds are extremely intelligent um, and especially hummingbirds. Uh, this was one of the facts that kind of blew my mind uh, when I started researching hummingbirds. So in the bird kingdom, hummingbirds actually have the largest brain proportion to body size. So their brain accounts for about 4.2% of the bird's weight. Uh, so they are tiny birds, uh, but when you talk about proportions, uh, their brain is extremely large. Hummingbirds have an excellent episodic memory. Uh, so they can remember every single flower that they have ever visited, uh, but they can also know how long it will take that flower to refill with nectar. So to put that into perspective, that's like us remembering every single meal we've ever made and how long it took us to make that meal. Um, luckily, most of us probably eat, you know, two to three meals a day. Um, believe remembering your whole lifespan um, of every single flower. And not only that, think about moving large distances like migratory patterns and remembering all of those flowers in each location. Uh, it's mind blowing. <laughs> so bird brain, I don't think so. Um, and I said that term episodic memory, uh, that was actually a new term for me. Uh, so I'm gonna define it. Episodic memory uh, is a type of long-term memory that can quickly remember and incorporate recalling specific events and details such as date, time, and location. Uh, so some examples of how hummingbirds use this, um, we talked about how it can remember you know, every flower and how long it takes for them to refill with nectar, uh, but they also won't visit that same flower twice until that flower has time to regenerate its nectar. Uh, so if, if you've ever observed hummingbirds out in a, a beautiful meadow or maybe in your backyard if you have a lot of flowers, uh, or if you have never done this, I challenge you to do it, is watch that hummingbird. Uh, you'll never actually see it return to that same flower until it regenerates that nectar. So it'll go to other flowers um, and give that time, that flower time to, to regenerate the nectar. They also remember the exact locations of all those flowers, um, but also the quality of the nectar. Uh, so a lot of us, we visit restaurants based on the food. If it's really good food, we'll go back. Um, it will be our favorite place. Um, kind of like it's the same with hummingbirds. Uh, they remember each flower and how good that nectar was in each flower that they've ever visited in their life. Which is just fascinating. <laughs> uh, it really does blow my mind. Um, something really cool that I learned too is with this episodic memory uh, is hummingbirds, will, they, will, they will remember their, care, their caretakers. Uh, so they will recognize, they'll learn to recognize the person who is in charge of refilling their weekly hummingbird feeder. So if you're somebody that refills a hummingbird feeder very often, um, you might feel a connection to the hummingbirds that visit your feeder uh, because they actually remember you. They know that you are bringing them something good. Um, so they'll remember your hand and they'll remember who supplies that food supply. So it's kind of like dogs. Um, I have a couple of dogs and I know that they love me because you know I'm their owner, but I know they really love me because I'm the one feeding them. Um, so just like a dog, hummingbirds really, they understand the people that are feeding them the good stuff. Another thing about uh, the hummingbird's brain uh, is their hippocampus, uh, which is in charge of learning and memory, is five times larger than any other bird in relation to the proportion of their body. So they have this huge hippocampus in their brain, um, and that's what helps with the episodic memory. That's what helps them uh, learn and remember uh, all of these fascinating uh, things, which is so cool. Um, also with these hummingbirds that are migrating large distances from Mexico up into even Canada, they'll actually remember each hummingbird feeder that, that they, they go to. Um, so some of the hummers that you're getting at your feeder, if you have one, uh, could be the same from you know, a year or a couple years ago, uh, they can remember if, if you're feeding them the good nectar, uh, they will come back. They actually remember all of that stuff. So a lot of you talked about um, their wing adaptation, uh, that they're able to fly forward and backwards. Um, and the way that they can do this is the main muscles that hummingbirds use in flight, they're called the pectoralis majors. 
Uh, and these muscles are almost entirely made up of these type one really fast twitch muscle fibers. And that'll allow the wings to beat up to 200 times per second. Uh, so if you're sitting down or standing up, I challenge you to try <laughs> to flap your wings as fast as possible, flap your, your arms as fast as possible. Uh, no way could we ever have wing beats up to 200 times per second. Um, that's just wild. And if you have a chance to observe birds or hummingbirds while they're you know, hovering or in flight, uh, you'll see that amazing uh, hummingbird flight pattern. They're also the only bird that will truly hover. Uh, so some of us might see maybe uh, falcons or raptors that are hovering, um, but they're actually not truly hovering based on the definition. Um, so the reason why hummers can, can hover, uh, they are adapted to, to do that because they need to stay in one place to enable to extract the nectar from those flowers. Um, so they don't always perch on things uh, like our hummingbird feeder, they'll just be hovering back and forth in order to get that. So hummingbirds, they are the only birds that can generate lift on both the downstream, downstroke and the upstroke of their wings. So all other birds, when they're flying, they're flapping their wings, gravity is pushing them down. They're only generating lift uh, on that downstroke when they're flapping down, that allows them to lift up. But hummingbirds can get that lift also on their, their upstroke. So they're, they're flying, that allows them to go up and down, forward and backward and make these really quick uh, twitching movements. There, uh, another thing about the, the hovering, which I thought was really interesting, um, is since they are the only bird that can actually truly hover, um, actually insects can do that as well. Uh, but if we think about an insect or we look at an insect, uh, they actually have more than one set of wings. Uh, so that allows them to hover. Um, and they also have exoskeletons. So they have their skeleton on the outside, uh, while hummingbirds, like humans, we have endoskeletons. We have bones on the inside. Their wing also goes in a figure eight. So their shoulder joint allows the wing to rotate up to 180 degrees. Uh, so that's what allows that fast and precise movements. Um, if you've observed them, you've seen them, they can go really fast in places um, and quick turns and crazy dives. Um, and they can actually reach speeds up to 60 miles an hour uh, in a dive. And this picture I have up on the screen, uh, that's from a page of the Sibley Field Guide to Birds. Um, he provides so many great identification uh, and great drawings, but he also has a lot of cool information. Uh, so we can actually see uh, these, these lines that he's drawn. And those are the male dive displays. Uh, so the male hummingbird will make these amazing flight displays in order to attract females. And each bird species is actually going to have uh, a different dive display. Um, so a Lucifer hummingbird's dive display is gonna be different than an Anna's hummingbird. Um, and so you can actually identify them based on this dive display, which is pretty fascinating. I remember a time I was in college studying out in the Mojave Desert, and I remember watching um, a Costas hummingbird, which we can see is that third one on the top, doing these crazy circles um, in the springtime, trying to attract the mate, trying to attract a female. Um, so those are really cool flight patterns to watch. Okay, we're gonna move on. That was so much information about hummingbirds. I, was, I hope you were able to, to digest some of that. Um, again, we, I will give you uh, an email with a PDF of these slides um, so you can go back and there's also the recording. So you'll be able to continue that information and hopefully spread it because it's pretty fascinating. So swifts, uh, they're super, superficially similar to swallows. Um, sometimes they can be mingling with swallows. Uh, a lot of us can confuse them for being swallows, um, but they're not. Um, so just like hummingbirds and all birds, they belong in the class of aves. Um, and more specifically, they're in that same order as hummingbirds. So apodiformes. Um, so they belong in the same order. So they're actually really closely related to hummingbirds. Um, and then the family that they belong to is apodidae. Uh, there's around 100 species of swifts worldwide. Um, and unfortunately, here in North America, we only have four species. Um, so that helps us to be able to identify them because uh, there isn't that many. Um, but across the world, there's around 100 species. And we can distinguish uh, swifts from swallows and other birds um, easily by their, their stiff wing movements and their scythe-shaped wings. So if we look at the wings on these, on these swifts, uh, a scythe is, you know, with that grim reaper, the tool that it holds. Um, that they, you know, if you garden or you might know what a scythe is, but if you watch their wings, they're really 
um, short in the beginning and then they go long. Um, and that actually is really closely related to how a hummingbird's uh, wing structure is. Uh, apodidae, which is the family uh, in Greek that translate to opus, uh, and that actually means without feet. Uh, so these birds are named uh, for not having any feet. They do have feet. Um, they, they need feet, uh, but they have these really tiny short legs and you'll virtually never ever see a swift perched on a tree like you might see any other bird. Um, they just, they're not adapted to be perched out on trees. Swifts occur on all continents uh, except Antarctica and you're not really going to see them uh, in the far north or in any large deserts or either on a, any oceanic islands. They don't really cross uh, any any oceans. Um, they usually spend their entire day flying uh, at really high altitudes uh, in search of tiny insects. Um, and eventually they come to, to rest or to roost uh, in their nest sites, which are either in sheltered chimneys or in cliff crevices. So really fascinating bird. So just like with hummingbirds, uh, type into the chat window, what, are you, what do you think are some specific adaptations that are uh, only for swifts? I kind of gave some away, but feel free to reiterate them. Um, what are some adaptations that makes a swift a swift? Now I'll actually check the chat window to see if I've missed any questions. Yeah, we'll, we'll do a little bit of, of identification later on. Thank you, Sarah, for handling the chat window. You're an expert. Yeah, that wing shape like we talked about earlier with the, the swifts, their tail. Yeah, really small beak. Yeah, they can fly at great heights. We'll talk about that. Ooh, I like the replace feathers once a year. Yeah, they, they molt, kind of short and squat. Awesome. Thank you for those answers. Uh, so just some specific adaptations that when we're looking at swifts, um, they have this really streamlined body. Um, so they have that kind of skinny body uh, along with the, the wings. They have those tapered scythe-like wings. Uh, so that have a really short upper arm and then that long kind of outer wing, which we consider kind of like our hand. Um, so they have a short arm and a really long hand, uh, which allows them to have a similar wing lift as hummingbirds and make really quick, fast movements. They also have very swift flight patterns. Uh, if you can tell, I use the, the word swift. <laughs> uh, they have really swift flight patterns. They, they're really fast and really quick. Um, and usually they're flying along cliffs, so they need that and they're looking for insects. They also have those really short legs, like they're named after a bird without legs. They have really tiny uh, short legs, which they don't really, really perch at all. Um, you'll actually never see them perched. All right, so swifts, like I said earlier, they, they're, they're never really perched. Um, so they spend most of their life on the wing, uh, whether that's foraging, sleeping, uh, or flying at really high speeds. Um, so Bird Conservancy, we're really interested uh, in the black swift uh, because they're one of the last birds that we didn't know where their wintering area was. We knew they migrated because they weren't either in their nesting area um, in the winter. So we knew that they migrated, but we had no idea where they went. So Bird Conservancy scientists, uh, along with other partners that we partnered with, uh, we went out looking for some answers. Um, so more specifically, one of our scientists, our research scientist, Rob Sparks, uh, he's the one conducting this research. Uh, and Colin Woolley, who did our band, bird banding webinar last week, uh, he's also helped a lot with this research as well. Um, and they're trying to study black swifts and learn more about their movement ecology, especially during their breeding season. So one of their main objectives to learn um, is just to learn more about their foraging patterns. Uh, we know that they fly really high elevation. We know that they're eating insects. Uh, but what time of day are they doing that? Um, and what specifically are they looking for? We also wanted to identify uh, their daily foraging routes uh, because that'll give us an understanding of their flight behavior, um, where their foraging hotspots are, and if there's any habitat relationships uh, between those flight behaviors and foraging hotspots. Another objective that, that we're looking at uh, with this research is to obtain a more precise migration pattern um, and actually know where they're, where they're wintering. Um, so in order to do this, to conduct this science, um, we don't get into little airplanes and you know, follow Black Swift all the way on its migration. Uh, we need to use uh, a little more specific tool. Um, so what we did 
is, well, not we, I didn't get to do it, unfortunately, uh, but Colin and Rob and some other partners, as uh, they went out to nesting locations in Colorado, um, and they placed these giant mist nets inside, call, inside waterfalls, um, trying to catch some, some black swifts. And what they did when they would catch one is they would put a normal metal band around its leg, that way we can identify it as an individual, but that's not gonna tell us where they're moving. That's just gonna tell us when, where they're going and when they're coming back. What we wanted to find out is exactly where that migratory path was going. So we attach what's called a geolocator. It's a little backpack. Uh, if you can picture a black swift in a little backpack that goes on their back. Um, and that geolocator, it's kind of like a GPS. Um, it's gonna tell us where that bird is moving to. The thing with these geolocator tags um, on these small birds is they don't just ping up information to a, to a satellite. We can't just hop on our computer and see exactly where uh, one of those black swifts are. We have to re-catch it. So we're hoping that with these geolocators that we re-catch them the following year back at their wintering site. Um, with these geolocator backpacks, uh, for some reason, if we, if we don't recapture it, uh, maybe if that bird dies or doesn't make its migratory path or decides to nest somewhere else, um, those backpacks will just fall off. Um, the material that they're on, they, don't, they won't last very long. Um, they just last as long as we need them to. So something that was really interesting um, is we actually, when we put these geolocators on, we did catch um, some black swifts again, and we downloaded all of this really cool information. Um, so on this uh, kind of graph, this, this image that we have here, um, this shows a, a migratory pattern of a black swift. Um, so we can see that we, we put that geolocator on in Colorado, and then we, that bird migrated through New Mexico, down into Mexico, and we can see it stayed along um, the shoreline. Uh, my guess is they stayed along that shoreline because there's insects and there's cliffs. Um, it's a straight kind of path. And then we found out that black swifts were actually, they would migrate all the way down into kind of Brazil, the Amazon area, uh, and that's where we figured out that's where their, in, their wintering area is. Um, which is exciting because they're one of the last birds where we, we didn't know where, where they were wintering. Um, so there's still research being conducted on this. We're still figuring things out. Um, but we also found out uh, that black swifts, they can travel an average of 160 kilometers daily uh, while they're foraging. So on the wing, they're really, they are on the wing. They're flying around all day trying to catch insects um, and eating. And another fascinating thing, uh, I saw someone uh, talked about their, their high elevation flight. Um, so their average elevation that we found uh, was around 10,200 feet. Um, so they can fly really high um, in order to get these insects that are just flying around in the air that we don't really see as humans. So we also learned something really cool. Um, a lot like an albatross, uh, black swifts will actually sleep while they're on the wing. So they have what's called an aerial roosting pattern. So black swifts can fall asleep while they're flying. Um, similar to albatrosses when they're kind of crossing the ocean and they're on these, these wind currents coming off waves, they can just fall asleep. Um, it's kind of similar to if you're on a long road trip and you're driving uh, and you could safely fall asleep at the wheel. Um, we cannot do that, unfortunately. Uh, do not try to do that. Um, but birds, while they're flying, they can actually, some can actually fall asleep while they're on the, on the wing. There's a lot more research going into this. Uh, I will include a link in my thank you email uh, to a blog post that Rob Sparks uh, put on this. So if you're interested in black swifts and the research that we're doing, um, you can dive deeper into their papers and, and what they're learning with black swifts. All right, so back to hummingbirds. Uh, we want to know how we can attract hummingbirds to our yard because they are such magnificent creatures. So in the chat window, uh, type, I'm sure a lot of you attract hummingbirds, so type in the chat window, what are ways that you use in your backyard? What are things that you do uh, to attract hummingbirds in your backyard. Oh, I see a good question about um, the geolocator backpack and, and the, the band on their short legs. Um, so with, with all bird banding, with all science that we do, the bird safety is number one. Um, so those backpacks, they go just uh, along their wings and onto their back and they, they can't feel them. Um, it doesn't affect any adaptation at all. Um, and then those short bands, uh, Colin did a really great webinar on bird banding 101 last week, if you have a chance to check that out on our YouTube channel. Um, even though they have those short legs, it's big enough for a band. Um, and once that bird is banded, uh, we won't be, it won't feel it. 
um, and it won't actually um, affect it too much at all. Um, and he goes more into the ethics of, of bird banding. Um, but without banding birds and without putting these backpacks on, we wouldn't know anything about um, these black swifts or other birds. And if we don't know where these birds are, are migrating to, um, we're not going to be able to conserve them. Um, so all these scientific efforts are all to observe. So I see a lot of you are filling out that, that chat window. Uh, sugar water, yep, in the feeder, flowers, native plants. All right, I'll talk about the differences uh, between swifts and swallows when flying, um, when we get to that identification part. Good questions. Plant red nectar flowers. Yeah, a lot of really good, good points here. Awesome. And if you're uh, interested in learning more about the native plants in certain areas and what you should be planting, um, you can go either, uh, we have a, Sarah actually did a birdie backyard um, webinar, which was fascinating. Uh, and she talked more about how you can find native plants for your area. Uh, most native plant societies uh, have a specific region. Um, so you can kind of learn more from that as well. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time right now to go into the planting, but thank you all for filling out the chat. Um, so, like you all said, um, we can attract hummingbirds to our yard uh, using hummingbird feeders. So, hummingbird feeders are great little uh, ways, uh, kind of cylinders that allow us to provide them nectar and sugar. Um, so, feeders come in all varying shapes and sizes. Uh, they're typically made of glass or plastic, um, and they're always going to have some kind of red accent. Uh, the reason why most hummingbird feeders are red, hopefully they're all red, um, is because hummingbirds are attracted to the color red. Um, so it's a color that attracts them. Um, and a lot of us can think, oh, they like red. We need to make everything red. Um, one thing I do suggest is do not dye your food or your sugar water red. Um, that can actually make hummingbirds sick, uh, which we'll dive into a little bit more. Um, but a lot of hummingbirds, they come in that black pla or red plastic, a red glass. Um, so they're attracted to red. And these hummingbird feeders, we hang them. So we can hang them from tree limbs or gardening poles. Um, you can find them online uh, or any home improvement store. <clears throat> um, you can also find them at thrift stores if you are one of those people that like to shop at thrift stores. If you are making your own hummingbird food, uh, which I highly suggest that you all should do because it's really simple and a lot cheaper than buying it. Um, all you need to do is you do one part sugar to four parts water and you boil that into a solution um, and you make sure that that sugar is all dissolved. Um, and then you can actually, you can make big batches of it because you really need to focus on replacing that solution. Um, and we recommend that you replace the solution every three to five days um, or even more than that if it's hot. And the reason why we wanna change out that solution frequently um, is because if that bird tastes fermented sugar water or it's moldy in any, any way, uh, like we said, they have that really great memory, that episodic memory. Um, so they will actually not return to your feeder. Um, so if they taste that bad sugar water that's been in there for too long, uh, you won't see that hummingbird at your feeder anymore. It will recognize that that is bad food um, and it will actually not return to your hummingbird feeder. Uh, so I wanna make sure that you replace it. Um, and a good way to do it, uh, I remember my, my mom doing this growing up, uh, is just boiling big, large quantities of it uh, and then just putting that solution in your refrigerator uh, and then replacing it whenever, whenever you need to. And again, do not add any food color. Uh, that red food coloring will make them sick. Um, also, don't add any honey to it. Um, honey is not good for hummingbirds as well. So just simple sugar and water. Uh, that's all the hummingbirds need to attract them. So when you're selecting a hummingbird feeder, uh, it's important to, to kind of think about these, where you're going to put it. Where is that hummingbird going to most likely be? We like to say that you want to place it at a bird's eye view. Um, but you also want to make sure that you're not putting up too many because again, you need to clean them and change out that sugar water. Uh, and you also keep in mind that you might be attracting um, other things to your feeders like ants or bees. Um, so make sure that you place it in an area that is out in the open, good for hummingbirds, um, but also not a, a pest to you. Also, uh, if you want more red, you can always add like red ribbons to it um, or any kind of red flashy things will attract hummingbirds if you're having trouble uh, with just your hummingbird feeder. Um, and like I said, these tubular native flowers, a lot of you said that as well. That's another great way uh, to attract hummingbirds. Um, I try to grow a lot of things and it could be really hard to grow a nice, a nice garden and nice flowers, especially if you don't have time. Um, there's a lot of wide variety of native 
fl flowers that you can use. Um, again, you can check out our Birdie Backyards webinar or uh, research on Google the best for your area since we're tuning in from a lot of different areas. And also don't give up. Um, attracting hummingbirds can be hard, uh, but it might just take a while for those hummingbirds to, to figure out that you have that really good spot for them. So here in the, in the front range of Colorado, uh, we don't get a whole bunch of hummingbirds year, year long. Uh, they kind of pass through our front range during migration, um, and then they go up into the mountains, uh, the broadtails. Uh, so we kind of have two peak periods for attracting hummingbirds here in Colorado. The first period is from mid-April to the end of May. Um, that's when the hummingbirds start migrating in. Um, and then the second period, which is one of the most important, is when they start their migration south. Um, that's from anywhere from 4th of July all the way to the end of September. Um, so don't worry, you can leave your hummingbird feeders out as long as you want. Um, that's actually not going to, to delay their migratory path. Um, they'll just get their drink when they need it and they will move on. Um, so if you have a feeder and you're not having great luck with it, um, don't give up. Uh, keep trying and hopefully you can attract them to your yard. All right, uh, another thing is we always like to say, um, use a, a field guide. Um, birding field guides are a great, great way to identify birds, to learn more about birds. Um, they're relatively inexpensive. You can get a free app on your phone, uh, especially if you do have hummingbird feeders. You can sit, you know, inside your dining room and watch hummingbirds up close um, and really see their flight patterns and their field marks in order to identify them. Um, so we really enjoy the Sibley Field Guide. Uh, the Merlin Bird ID app is a great app to have on your phone. Uh, it really helps you identify birds, um, not only by sight, but also by sound. So we're going to get into our bird quiz, uh, talk a little bit more about identifying bird species. Um, Luckily for you, to narrow down to family, it's not going to be very hard. Um, I'm only throwing hummingbirds at you and swifts, uh, so I don't expect to see a sparrow or any other warbler or anything in this bird quiz. Uh, so if you have a field guide, now's a good time to pull it out. Um, if you don't want anyone to spoil it for you, you really want to try to identify, um, just hide the, your chat window if you'd like. Um, if you know what that bird is right away, give it a couple seconds before you blurt it out. Um, I know I get really excited when I know a bird. Um, that's totally okay. Um, and also just have fun, uh, guess with it. Hummingbirds can actually be really hard to identify. Um, so guess, guessing, if you're guessing, you are learning, uh, which is something I always like to tell people. So here we go. Now's a chance for me to, to not talk so much at you and a little bit more time for us to interact uh, and to learn from each other. So here's our first bird. All right, so this, this bird uh, likes to, it's, uh, its habitat it likes to be in dry coniferous woods. It likes to have openings like meadows. Um, in the summer here in the Rockies, you can hear them buzzing around all over the place. Um, these are mostly seen in more of the mountainous areas, um, not so much on the east coast. Uh, the male has that really nice rosy red gorget. Um, it has this really long, they actually have a really long tail. Uh, which will help us identify it as well. Um, and this was actually one of the first birds I, I heard and identified when I moved to Colorado. Uh, I was out climbing, I could hear something flying around that I thought was an insect. Um, and my friend who actually worked for Bird Conservancy at the time uh, told me that what it was um, and it was not an insect. Uh, so yeah, great clue. Um, it is not an Eastern species, it's more in the West. Uh, so if you have a field guide, looking at those range maps is really, really important. And on the left, uh, most of the males usually have that really nice red gorget, um, that really beautiful iridescent feathers. And on the right, that's the same species, um, but that's either a female or an immature male. They can be really, really hard to, to tell apart. So a lot of you got it. Um, you're between two species, the ruby-throated and the broad-tailed. Um, it does have that ruby red throat, which can definitely throw us off, um, but this is actually a broad-tailed hummingbird. Um, so you can, Tell that difference. Uh, with hummingbirds, be, your location is really important. Um, so where you're identifying it, that's why I'm trying to give you some hints of where you would see these birds. Um, if you live in Colorado, I hope you've heard these or seen these. Um, if you go hiking anywhere in the mountains in the summer, they're everywhere, they're beautiful, and they're so cool to hear. All right, here's our next bird. Uh, these are, this is actually two species um, that can be extremely hard to identify. Um, so the bird on the left, uh, they don't really have too much of an overlapping range, which helps you identify them. Um, these are actually the only two orange colored birds 
uh, in North America, two orange colored hummingbirds in North America. So the one on the left, that bird nests in open coniferous forest and riparian woods. And this is mostly seen throughout the West during migration and in a variety of habitats. It really likes mountain meadows. The bird on the right is seen mostly in coastal chaparral and mostly in California and along the coast or in California. Um, the Sibley Field Guide actually says that it's almost impossible uh, to identify these unless you have them in hand. Um, so if you have them in hand, you can actually measure the wing or the tail length, and that'll help you uh, if you're in that overlapping range. So some of you are getting it. Um, I know someone said this was their favorite bird earlier. Um, so again, there's only two of these. So if you do have your field guide open, um, that will definitely give away what you have, what we have here on the left and the right. Uh, but does anyone notice any differences between these birds? Um, they look very similar to me. We're starting to, to get it. Okay, maybe their stature, how they're, how they're perched. Um, yeah, so I kind of noticed, so the birds that we have, a lot of you got it. Um, on the left, we have our Rufus hummingbird. Uh, which is a beautiful, beautiful bird. And on the right is an Allen's hummingbird. Uh, their gorgets look a little different, uh, mostly because the one on the right, the Allen's is puffed up. It has that beautiful lighting, um, but there really isn't that much different about them. They kind of have the similar amount of this Rufus orange. Uh, they have, you know, the little white on their, on their body. They're, a little, they're the similar size and shape. Um, so really knowing your location is gonna help you identify. Um, and if you're in one of those overlapping ranges, it can be really hard. All right, here's our next bird that we have. Uh, so something I noticed about this bird is those iridescent feathers, uh, they're not only on the throat, they actually extend up onto the head as well. Um, this is the most common hummingbird along the Pacific coast. Uh, so if you live in the Pacific coast, this might remind you of a backyard bird that you might have. Um, I grew up in San Diego, I saw these all year long. Um, they're everywhere. Uh, they nest in our backyard, my parents' backyard. Uh, they would go to our feeders. Um, and they can actually only be seen along that Pacific coast. Um, so kind of like the ruby-throated hummingbird, they're really specific to their range. Awesome, a lot of us are getting it. It's the Anna's hummingbird. Again, probably one of the first birds I ever identified um, without even knowing it. Um, they're beautiful birds. Um, and they have that very kind of localized location. All right, so we're kind of running low on time, so I'm gonna just keep it moving. Um, here is a nice, very blurry picture uh, of one of the really cool birds um, that we've talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, I like to think of them as flying tuxedos. Uh, so we see the black and the white. Um, I always like to say they're ready uh, for a fancy dinner party or ready to go to a wedding. Um, Great, I love seeing that people are narrowing it down uh, to family. This is in the Swift family. Uh, this picture is probably blurry because they fly so fast. Um, and it's really good field mark is this white on its throat. Um, so we were talking earlier, someone asked a question about identifying swallows versus swifts. Again, that can be really difficult, uh, but really looking at their wing shape and their flight patterns. Uh, so they have these, you know, scythe shaped wings and their wing beats are gonna be a lot more shallow than a swallow. Swallows are gonna be doing kind of more gliding. Uh, swifts use really shallow wing beats um, and they, they're doing kind of more fast movement. So looking at the shape of the wing will really help you identify them. Um, these aren't seen uh, actually uh, on, the, on the East Coast. They're really only seen uh, on the West Coast. Um, and again, this was my favorite bird. So if you remembered it, a lot of you have it. It's the white-throated swift. Um, if you're a rock climber uh, or you really like to be out um, along cliff edges, you'll hear these and see these flying all over the place. Uh, maybe next time you see them, you'll recognize them as a flying tuxedo. All right, our next species of swift. Like I said earlier, we only have four species in North America, uh, so that'll help you narrow it down. So that was a white-throated swift. This bird is actually really uncommon in the west, uh, but it can be seen on the eastern side of the Rockies all the way to the east coast. Um, and I, I said earlier that swifts, they remind us, remind us of, of wild places. Um, this swift is actually seen mostly in cities and in towns. Um, I saw one yesterday over my house and I live pretty close to Denver. Um, and these almost exclusively 
uh, nest in chimneys. They're, the answers are coming through. Uh, the chimney swift. Uh, I remember I saw my first one uh, when I was in Cape Cod a couple years ago, and it kind of blew my mind. They're, they're pretty cool. These have really shallow wing beats, and they, they have this really kind of chittering call when they're in the air. Uh, I forget what field guide, but one of the field guides said that uh, they reminds them of a flying cigar. <laughs> so if you look at their kind of the, the their shape of their body uh, can remind us of the shape of a cigar. Uh, good job. That is the chimney swift. Uh, you guys are, are doing a great job. Our last bird that we're going to identify today. Uh, this bird is an extremely cool bird. Uh, they nest uh, mainly in damp coastal cliffs or behind waterfalls. Um, I have not seen one yet. I've tried so hard to find them and I've not found one yet. Um, but we can see it on its nest here in a little crevice and flying really high above. Uh, the, the color is not the best in this picture, but they are pretty dark. Um, and they nest behind waterfalls, which if you have your field guide out, it's, a, it's kind of a, a, a giveaway. Not many birds nest behind waterfalls. See, a lot of us are kind of starting to get it. Um, this is one of the birds that Bird Conservancy is conducting research on. Uh, this is the black swift. Uh, they're so elusive. They're very local um, to where, where they, they nest. So you're not going to see these very often. Like I said, it's really hard. I've never seen one. Um, I've tried to find them, haven't found them yet. Um, but if you are in Colorado, uh, a great place to go see these um, is Zapata Falls. Uh, Zapata Falls is near the Great Sand Dunes. Um, you can see them out there. Uh, they nest behind the waterfall there. And either really, really early in the morning uh, or in the evening, that's your best chance to catch a look at these black swifts. Um, I did not add the Vox's swift into this one. I see a lot of you, some of you answered that. Um, but Vox's swifts are really similar to chimney swifts. Um, they look very, very alike. So I would like to end my webinar like this. Um, Birding is a skill. Uh, the more that you do it, the more that you research, the more that you practice, the better you're going to get about it, uh, get with it. Uh, birding, it, it, it provides us with curiosity. Um, they can be really hard to identify, um, and that curiosity really strives for us to learn more. Um, so I challenge you, attend our webinars, um, go on to Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Uh, they are a great resource. Um, birding is a lifelong process. Um, and that's why I think we all love it. It's a great hobby and you can do it for your whole life and still be curious and not know a lot of things. So lastly, keep in touch with us. Uh, we love hearing from you. Um, and unfortunately with, you know, the COVID-19, um, our education department has had a huge loss in revenue this year. Um, uh, we're trying to keep it going with virtual programs. Um, but the future of education <laughs> is kind of in this weird, uncertain time. Uh, if you are in a position to help us keep these education programs going, um, especially during these uncertain times, uh, if you could please support us, you can go to our website at birdconservancy.org slash donate. Uh, it means the world to myself, to Sarah, to everyone at Bird Conservancy, uh, our education team. Um, we're a very, very tight-knit team, and we want to keep that going. Uh, so if you are in any, uh, if you can, please support us. Um, and next week, we have a really fun webinar coming up. Uh, Sarah will be presenting all about sparrows. Uh, so if you've been having trouble identifying sparrows, if you think of them as the little brown bird, like a lot of us do, uh, she's going to help you with those really hard identifications and give you some tips and tricks. I'll also be sending out a survey uh, for our webinars. So if you have a chance to fill out that survey, you might have already got it. Please let us know. Give us feedback. We want to make these uh, as best as we possibly can, um, especially because we'll, we're going to keep these going. Um, we're going to keep virtual programming going for a while. So Sarah and myself will stick around um, for any last questions, maybe any questions I might have missed. Um, Sarah, you can unmute yourself and let me know if there's any questions that I missed. Uh, but we'll stick around. Uh, if you need to go off, get some lunch, uh, or need to do other things, thank you for joining us. Uh, I had a lot of fun researching this. Um, go look at some hummingbirds. Go birding. I'll check the chat window to see if there's any questions. All right. Thank you so much, Tyler. That was incredible. Um, there weren't a whole lot of questions answered. I think everyone was just so wrapped with, with all of the information. One thing that I tried to answer, but I didn't know if you had come across anything specific um, 
was advice on keeping like ants and bees and wasps away from hummingbird feeders? Great question. And I think that that's one of the things with attracting birds is you're going to attract a lot of other uh, animals as well and probably animals they don't really like. Um, I, from what the research that I did, I say just placing them in, in open areas. Um, so if you place your, your bird feeder in an area that's maybe not near a window or near your house or near any like trash cans or food, um, that'll probably help you uh, not attract those, those pests as much. So that's the advice I would, I would give is um, don't put it in an area that you think you would attract those. Perfect. And I, oh, go ahead. Uh, I see the keeping the feeders cool will keep them from going bad. Um, possibly uh, the only thing if to keep them cool, either you need to keep them in the shade um, or put some kind of coolant on it. Um, my tip is honestly just to make a big batch of that sugar water um, and just switch it out, you know, every three to five days. Um, and I don't think it matters what type of sugar, just normal table sugar um, and water is, is enough. Yeah. yeah, we definitely, it definitely just needs to be cheap, plain old white cane sugar, not like turbinado or sugar in the raw. Mm -hmm. The birds, hummingbirds don't want the fancy sugar. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, also, yeah, I see this one, one from uh, bring, bring your bird feeders, your hummingbird feeders in a night if you are near bears. Um, I know that was a problem down at Chatfield State Park. They had a bear on site. Uh, they had to bring their hummingbird and all feeders in um, at night. So if you have bears near your area, I would say just bring all of your um, all of your, your bird feeders inside. We don't want to attract bears. Okay. Um, there's one last question here from Alex. Are oleander plants bad for hummingbirds? And I'm unsure what an oleander plant is. Yeah, you know I'm, I'm not too sure. Um, again, we're the bird, we're the bird people. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so it's super poisonous. I'm guessing maybe for humans. Um, mm -hmm. Further research is needed. Um, I'm guessing that hummingbird, I mean, hummingbirds, like we said, they're so intelligent um, and they're so adapted to getting specific nectar uh, that I'm sure if a hummingbird is, is eating from any plant, um, they remember which ones are good and which ones are bad. Um, so my guess is whatever plants that you have, um, if you see a hummingbird going to it, they remember that that's where the good nectar is coming from. Um, but great question. I, I do not know. I would love to do some more research on that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. oh Thanks, Kelsey. Kelsey says can be bad for most species. Okay, we're mm -hmm. all learning today. <laughs> Good to know. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for, for joining this. Uh, this, really, again, was one of my favorite webinars I've done research on. Hummingbirds are so cool. Swifts are so cool. Um, I hope you have a chance to find some either in your backyard uh, or on your next adventure, look for some swifts. Um, again, Sarah will be with us next week uh, for some really cool facts about sparrows. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, thank you so much, and I'll look forward to an email coming from you soon.